tempted to do that. If you remember last Sunday, we had, uh, uh, I guess you would say, a testimony service. It's kind of Lord just kind of lowered down and met with us. And that was needed. But throughout the week, I began to think about all the blessings that God has given and all of, all of the times that I've fallen short. And He loved me even still. And uh, it, it blessed my heart. If it didn't bless anybody else, it blessed my heart to know how, how human I am and how quickly I forgive, but how easily he forgives. Take your Bibles this morning. Turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 10. Hebrews, chapter number 10. And uh, we'll read a few verses, starting in verse number 22. And again, I want to uh, remind you, if you've adopted a boy from the boys' home, uh, those gifts need to be here by next Sunday. So keep that in mind, if you will. Hebrews chapter number 10. Now, we, we, we've got a lot of people out, so I need y'all all to say amen all at the same time. So it sounds like we're full up this morning. All right, Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 22. Word of God says, let us draw near... With a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. Let's pray this morning. Dear Father in heaven, we love you, and we thank you for your blessings. God, we thank you for these folks that have come out today. We pray that you'd richly bless them. Now, God, we understand that there's quite a few that are not here today. Lord, for different reasons, I'm sure. But, Lord, we ask you that you might just draw them uh, back to a place where they can join us again at our next appointed time. But, Father, we do want to say today that we, we're thankful, Lord, for these that are here. Lord, we could have all stayed home. We could have stayed in bed. and We could have uh, done what pleased our flesh. And Lord, I'm not saying that's what others have done, but I'm just saying that we could have. But I thank you today that we've kind of pulled ourselves together and come. Lord, it's been a busy week for everybody. Lord, it's a dreary day today. Lord, but this is your day. And, God, I want to rejoice in it. And I want to give you the praise for all that you've done for me. 
And God, we ask you that you would just touch us in the message. I pray that you'd bless your people. We pray that you'd encourage us and strengthen us. We pray that you'd give us strength for the journey because there is a journey ahead. God, it may be an uphill journey starting tomorrow, maybe a downhill starting, uh, starting tomorrow, but we pray that you would be there with us. I pray that you'd give us the strength to do your will in our lives. We love you. We thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. If I had a title this morning, it would be All in the Family. We see that there's a few phrases here in verse number 22, verse number 23, and verse number 24 that kind of lends to that, <clears throat> excuse me, to that idea of being all in the family. And that phrase is, let us. And so we'll deal with that this morning, give you about three or four things, and then uh, go about our day. But uh, there is good news before we ever get to verse number 22. If you look back in verse number 17, you see, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. So we see that good news here in this chapter number 10 of the book of Hebrews is that there is forgiveness of sins, and we ought to rejoice of that this morning. Not only is there forgiveness of sin, but if you look at verse number 19, you see that the blood of Christ is sufficient. And I'm glad today that there was a sacrifice. He says that there uh, was uh, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. If you look back in those Old Testament uh, uh, scriptures where he tells who is allowed to go into the Holy of Holies, what they are allowed to do. And he, I've been studying about that, uh, that apparel of Aaron over the last several days and all of the things that are essentially to safeguard him and to uh, present him as holy to God. But I'm glad that on the cross of Calvary there was one other uh, that went into the Holy of Holies and he went one time and he went one time for all. And here in Hebrews it says that that blood is sufficient. But then we look at verse number 21 to carry that thought on. It says that we have a high priest over the house of God. Who is that? That is the Lord uh, Jesus Christ today. You don't have to depend upon another. I, I, get, uh, I get a little discouraged when I think of different faiths uh, that, uh, that depend on men to absolve them of sin. Or they depend on other humans to absolve them from sin. There is no man or woman that is able to dictate, Brother David, whether or not you have sin in your life or whether or not it is forgiven or not. That comes from God. And uh, Jesus Christ is that high priest that is able uh, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He is able to be that advocate on our part and declare before a righteous judge that his sin is no more. His sin is washed away. I took the penalty of that sin. No one else can do that. So we have good news here in chapter number 10. But then we get to verse number 22, and he says, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. This let us speaks of a fellowship in Christ. Now, March 22nd, March 21st, I think, was our last service here. It was a Wednesday night. Might have been the 22nd. We, you, you know, you were here, but we had to quarantine. We went to online service. We came back with parking lot. Then we came back Sunday morning. Then we eased our way in. Then we had to leave again because of COVID, and we stayed out for a while, came in with parking lot service, came in just as we are, uh, and it's been different. It's been different. Can anybody, y'all just raise your hand. Has it been different? Has it been awkward? Anybody want to be honest before the Lord? Has it been awkward? I'm going to go ahead and raise two hands, Miss Pat. It's been awkward, I'm telling you. I like those hymns that are that are saying, Brother David, I can't remember the name of that song. I got singing the shower pipe, kicked the side of the door out. That's uh, uh, not thanks to Calvary, but thank you for something to know that you that chorus that you lead all the time. Man, I got to sing in that thing the other day, and I just had church. It wasn't up on me and my bar of soap, but I was having a good time, I'm telling you. And it's been awkward not to have those things. It's been awkward not to be able to go and hug somebody and, and fellowship with them face to face. It's been awkward to have to fist bump or elbow bump or wave through plexiglass and all of these goofy things that we've had to do, but we've had to do them for a reason. 
But through all of that, we still have a family of fellowship. He says, let us. That's you and I. That's we. That's this body. First Corinthians, Paul says that there is a body of Christ. Now, Brother Jim, you may be one part of that body. Miss Kim may be another. Nathan may be another. We're all a different part of that body, but we work in, 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 in we work in a, as a company together and we form that body of Christ, but we can have fellowship one with another. Roger Campbell said that this, this phrase, let us, ties earthly fellowship to heavenly anticipation. Now I can go and I can see a uh, uh, someone that I, I've, I've met, you know, outside of church, and I can have some sort of fellowship with them, and and it's by we'll see you later, and maybe a month or two or four or, or a year later we might see one another again, and kind of pick up where we left off. But there's something different about the body of Christ, a body in a sanctuary. I'm talking about Lighthouse Baptist Church. It's, there's a little bit different type of fellowship there. Uh, it is something that you have that, that anticipation, not only that you will see them again Wednesday night or Sunday or Sunday night, uh, but even if something were to happen tragically, that we would see them again one day. I told you about Aaron Wilburn that had passed away and uh, he wrote that song four days late that carried a pack in New River saying, when Jesus is four days late, he's still on time. And, and I just kind of wondered how many prayers have gone up. And, and I think back to even Brother John, how many prayers were gone up or sent up to heaven that says, God, uh, don't take him. God, heal him. God, give him what he needs right now. And God all along was saying, I will. I am. I'm doing it right now. But his healing will not be here. It will be over there. And when it seemed like heaven was shut down, when it seemed like hell or, or heaven was, was silent and we could not hear from God and we blamed God for being late, God was still right on time doing what he wanted to do all along. It's been difficult in this COVID situation. But I want you to know that it's still a family affair. Let's try to preach the message this morning. Number one, we are drawn together in the same assurance. Now this blesses my heart. He says, verse number 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from, evil, from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. We are drawn, number one, together in the same assurance. We need to understand today that though we may have been saved, listen to me, we may have been saved in different fashions. Uh, we testified of this last week. Some were saved in church. Some were saved as a young person. Some were saved as an older one. Some were saved outside or, or maybe in some strange place. I remember leading a, a lady up in Knoxville to the Lord in, in the McDonald's uh, a little uh, a little seating area. And it, it was kind of odd, Rachel, but that's where she got born again. Other people were saved at an altar or or maybe in a Sunday school room or out on the street somewhere. But, but no this today that the same assurance for that one that was saved at an old-fashioned altar is the same assurance that we have if we were saved in some other place other than he, there was there's a man up he, I don't know if he still goes to Bay Mountain Baptist Church or not um, his name is Jay Bergen y'all may remember him I know my family does but brother Jay Bergen and his wife started coming to church there years ago before we left and uh, I used to love Miss Pat when it come testimony time there were two people that I did not want to testify because if they did it she shut everything down will not go that route but if he ever got filled enough brother David to testify man, my heart would sit there and it was it was just shaking because I knew I knew his testimony Rachel I knew what he was about to say I knew that he was going to say I had a praying mama during the World War II. And I knew that my mama knew that I was over in Germany or over in France or overseas somewhere. And Allie, I knew that he was about to say that 
One day, when the shells were coming my direction, I did not even recall what country I was in, but I heard Mama's prayer, and I heard the Spirit of God speak to my heart. And He said, I got saved in a tank in Europe somewhere. I have no idea what country I was in. I have no idea what no, no idea what day it was or what time it was. I do know, however, that he saved me. Now, you're talking about something that might mess some of these folks up that, that have to have a physical place to go, have to have a physical time to refer to. That's going to mess you up. He didn't, but David, he was in a tank. Mortar shells were going all over him. And he, I, 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 he had no idea where he was, but he knew, Brother Jim, he knew that he got saved. You see, whether you have a testimony like that or you're on death row or skid row or whatever it is, we have an assurance. He says, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. This word assurance is a word that removes all doubts. It's a, it's a word that eliminates uncertainty. We are assured. Of what God has done. Verse number 22 here. It says that we have. That full assurance. I, I, uh, I struggle so much. With a heavy heart for those folks. That don't have that assurance. Of salvation. They go through their life. I, I remember a lady that she has passed away now. Used to pastor her. And she came from a different denomination. And that she believed that you could lose your salvation. And as her time was coming to an end, I had the opportunity to be able to talk to her and witness to her. And I believe my wife also uh, kind of had this same conversation with her and knew the life that she lived, saying, I mean, she was a saint. I'm telling you, she was a saint. She loved the Lord. I know she loved the Lord. But as her days were coming to an end, we asked that question, do you know for sure that you're going to heaven? And those faithful words came, I just don't know. And I thought, what a shame to live your entire life not really knowing that you've been born again. Not really knowing that God has forgiven you of your sins. And going into that time of death with so much fear and anxiety. But this assurance that Hebrews 10, 22 says, let us draw together, draw near unto a true heart, with a true heart in full assurance of faith. And remember faith, again, the next chapter over, the next page over in my Bible. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, and the evidence of things not seen. In verse number 14, we'll, we'll reference this and go back to verse number 22. But it is perfected forever. Look at verse number 14. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Again, if we have been under the spout where the glory comes out, if we have ever gotten in that fountain that's filled with blood, drawn from Emmanuel's veins, you can rest assured today that you are perfected forever. Now does this word mean that you are never going to sin? Absolutely not. That's not what we're talking about. But that it means spiritually how you will always be bound by Christ in and of himself in safety and in full assurance of salvation. If you look at verse number 35 cast not away therefore your confidence which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience that after ye have done the will of God ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. That this heart here in Verse number 35 down through verse 30. It's a heart filled with assurance. The writer here says, cast not away thy confidence, which hath great recompense. Well, there is a reward of the reward. 
There is a payment for this reward here. That's this recompense of reward. But he says, cast not away your sure. I don't, I, I've said this till I'm blue in the face. I don't take my testimony lightly. I make a lot of mistakes. I say things on the spur of the moment sometimes. I, I think things out of, out of the bounds of the gospel. And, and I have to ask for forgiveness. But I'm going to tell you something. There's something. I can tell you the date. I can tell you the time. I can take you to the place. But that makes me no more saved than it does that man that didn't know what country he was born in. But what I know is I can go back. because, And I believe God did this because he knows how my mind works, Brother Samuel. If I did not know I would constantly be second guessing but I'm glad that God gave me a concrete place where I can go back a concrete time where I can go back I, I'm telling you Miss Denisha I forget this plexiglass uh, Miss Denisha the day that I got saved the clock that I looked at said 2.20 p.m. I don't know that that clock ever worked before or ever worked after but I know that second hand was going around and I know it was about an hour and a half or two hours after lunch so Brother Jim that's what I'm going on but Brother Jody I'm telling you today uh, that if you do not remember that time if you do not remember that place as long as there is a place and a part that you've taken uh, with the Son of God. There is a change that has happened and God will give full assurance of that. Amen. It's, it's, it's all in the family. Let us draw near. Number two. <clears throat> Number two, we are held together in the same hope. First we were drawn together. Now we're held together in the same hope. Luke verse 23. We see this, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. You, you, Braylon asked this morning, we used to bank at TBA Credit Union up in Knoxville. She got a birthday card. And in that birthday card said, if you'll color this and bring it back to the credit union, you'll, you'll get a birthday gift. So she was asking, is there any TBAs down here? Well, no. But uh, if you color it next time we go back to Tennessee, we'll, we'll take it by then. You can get a gift. So what does that have to do with anything? Listen to this. Listen to this. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without way before he is faithful that promise. He is faithful that promise. Braylon works in such a way that if you say something, she will remember it until the day that she dies. And so I, in saying that, if you will color that and you will take that card with you to Tennessee the next time we go, I know that she will not forget that. And she will color that. She colored it on the way to church. She will pack it probably when we get back home in her suitcase so as not to forget it. And she will remind me, Daddy, don't forget. We've got to go by the bank when we get home. Because there are some things that I have promised. Now, I, I'm, I'm, Braylon, don't listen to me. There are some things that I have promised conditionally that I have given out of mercy and grace whether or not she met that condition. And God, too, has given us some things even though we've not necessarily met some conditions. But there's been a few times that I've held her her. Toes to the fire, if that's the right phrase. You're not getting this unless you do this. And then she completes that task. I do my best to get it for her. But there's been a few times where my promise has outweighed my ability to provide. But not one time, not one time has God ever promised us something and not been able to provide for that promise. Not one time. He says he is faithful that promise. And just that phrase alone, he is faithful that promise, gives such hope for verse number 23. Because he is faithful that promise, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Because we know that God has promised and God has come through on every promise, let's hold fast what we're hope. Let us hold fast that profession that we're clinging to. I believe it's page 100, 318, 317. I know whom I have believed, 
and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. There's scripture that says the exact same thing. I believe it's the Apostle Paul. He didn't say, I know what, I know when. He said, I know in whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I committed unto him against it. What is that all eternity? What is that ourselves? What is that that we have committed unto him against that day? Our very souls lay in the balance, and you can mark it down today, that if God has promised you, God will fulfill that promise. Let us hold together in the same hope. This word hold fast, it carries an idea of believing our beliefs and doubting our doubts. If you know what you believe and you know why you believe it, hold on to those things. Because you can mark it down that the devil or yourself will cause doubt to come. And when doubt comes your way, doubt your doubt. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith. Mm. Braylon went to a playground the other day and she wanted to go on the monkey bar. So she climbed up on the monkey bars and she grabbed that first one and just in a little bit she came running back. I said, what's wrong? She just couldn't hold on. Just couldn't hold on. If your life depends upon holding on to some. It's going to be more than just a casual grip. It's going to be more than just, just well, you know, if I fall, I fall. It's no big deal. And as I, I've already mentioned, we've committed unto him our souls, our eternity. And if that is the case, when he says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith, I have to go back to that day that I was saved. And I have to realize that that is when my eternity with God began. And I have to hold fast to it. Not, not wavering. Not waffling one way or the other. But rather gripping it as if my life depended on it. And when Satan or myself tries to draw me away, I can hold on to that profession. We are held together in the same hope. It's unwavering confidence that we're speaking about here. If you turn back to chapter number 9, look at verse number 28. It says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. That finished work on Calvary, that finished work on the cross, that finished work of Christ is what we are holding on to because he promised that on that day he took away our sins. And we received that gift the day that we were saved. We should rest in his resurrection. We should rest in his return. Number three, we're working together in the same love. Verse number 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. He is faithful that comes, verse 24, excuse me. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Let us consider one another. I believe that we can say, and I have not looked this up, but just in my own mind, I almost, I almost picture this word consider, not just thinking about someone in passing, but rather to prefer them, to prefer someone else. Uh, let's take, for instance, Miss Kim. Uh, Miss Kim Taylor the other day, she came in. I'm not bragging on myself by any means. I'm just making an illustration. She came in, she had a... a a pad because I'm sure she knew she was going to be sitting in those chairs. So she had a, 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 a seat cushion with her. And I saw her go over there and I saw her kind of kind of gingerly sit down and I knew that she wasn't feeling well. So I asked if maybe one of these chairs might be a better fit for her. And 
She said, it might just be. So guess what we did? We moved the chair, didn't we, Brother Joe? We just moved the chair. You know what that is? That's not just a consideration. Oh, I wonder if she's hurting, but that's a preferring. In other words, we're saying, I don't need this comfortable chair, so let's give it to someone that needs a little more comfort, that may be hurting a little more than I am. Let's prefer someone. And that is what I'm picturing here in our Christian lives. He says, uh, let us consider one another or prefer one another, but here's the rest, to provoke unto love and to good works. We think of a provocation, or we think of this word provoke as something that always ends in a negative way. Uh, well, they got into a fight. Well, so-and-so provoked it. Well, the scripture says, let's don't provoke one another to anger, or to wrath, or to hard feelings, or to bitterness, or to jealousy, but rather, let's provoke one another to love and to good works. How many have heard growing up, kill them with kindness? I used to hate used to hate when somebody would say, just kill them with kindness. Because, you know, I was back there in Psalm 59. Lord, just kill them. <laughs> you know, just, I'm good with that. Just, just kill them. I've been thinking about it all week long because of a certain person that I uh, had some dealing with. So I'm like, man, Lord, just get me out of that chapter. Let me move on. Because I, I want to just say, sick them, God. But then the Holy Ghost said, kill them with kindness. Uh, okay, Lord, change me. Lord, help me. Lord, love me. Let me love them like you love me. And then my mind, but then my mind says, but they don't deserve it. My heart says, neither did you. The Holy Spirit says, show them grace. And my, my flesh says, they don't deserve it. And God said, neither did you. The Holy Spirit once again says, show them mercy. And I say, they don't deserve it. He said, neither did you. But look what I've done. Look how I've loved you. Look how I've shown you grace. Look how I've shown you mercy. Yes, they don't deserve it. But do it anyway. Kill them with kindness. Let us consider one another, provoking one another to love and to good works. If you look at this, we see in verse 22 <clears throat> that there is faith. We see in verse number 23, this hold fast our profession, we see hope. But then in verse 24, we see love. If we were to turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter number 13, you would see this. 1 Corinthians 13 is that chapter that's known as the chapter of love. And I love the way Paul writes here. It's just to me, this should be, this is literature. I realize it is scripture, but it's, I mean, it's, it's almost poetry. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I become a sounding brass or a tinkling sound. He said, though I have the skill and the ability to, to speak with men and to fellowship with angels or to God, but if I have no love, no charity, he says, I'm just a sounding brass or a tinkling sound. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mystery and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I can remove mountains, and he says, and have not charity, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity, love, suffereth long. And is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. Is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. Is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity. But rejoiceth in all truth. Beareth all things. Believeth all things. Hopeth all things. Endureth all things. Charity never faileth. Mm. Without love, I realize, as I just illustrated, 
first have faith, then hope, then love. And I believe that in order to have this love, we have to have faith, we have to have hope. It comes in, in that way. It was designed that way. In order for us to have the love of Christ, we have to have the hope of Christ in us. But in order to have the hope of Christ in us, we had to have, at some point, had faith and put our faith and our trust in Christ. But if you have faith and you have hope, but you do not love the brethren, then that faith and that hope is in vain. There's a lot of folks today. I, I, I don't want to give a vague, I don't even want to give a vague statistic. I'll just say there are folks today that they are so full of faith and they are so full of hope, but they do not love. And, and, and I'll say this boldly, they have missed the mark. They don't love the brethren. They don't love the church. The only time they do is when they can get something from the church or when they can get some recognition. But I tell you this evening, this morning, that we must have love. I told you the title of the message is all in the family. We are all working together in the same love. Love is considered. Love's consideration provokes more love. Love's consideration provokes two good works. Love will affect any congregation. If you look back in Acts chapter number two, the church is just starting to get traction. It's just starting to roll. And all of a sudden, I believe it's verse number 41, I believe it talks about as many as believed, they continued in the apostles' doctrine and they began, that's the first real Pentecost service that we have. They began to sell things and give to the poor. They began to go uh, into the highways and byways and reach one another and bring Bring them to God. The love of God can affect anybody. Quickly, lastly, let's look at this. We meet together in the same anticipation. Verse number 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. He says, let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. The importance of believers gathering for worship cannot ever be overstated. There is not a fiber of my being that doesn't want to be at church. I want to be in God's house. And, I, and I've testified to this fact. When we were locked down and we were only doing online services, when I myself had COVID and I was preaching online, you better mark it down that even, no matter how bad I may have felt, I wanted to be here. And I believe most of you wanted to be here. I'd say all of you wanted to be here. There's others that are not here today that they want to be here. They just cannot be here. So I don't want you to think I'm beating anybody down this morning. But we can never underestimate the importance of meeting together. I believe we can grow together by meeting together. That fellowship can be stronger by meeting together. Oh, uh, oh boy over here, uh, Kurt, I didn't know him. I met him a year or so ago at your uncle's funeral, I believe it was. Didn't know anything about him. That joker got saved, started getting to know him a little bit better. That fellowship started a little bit better. And then some ugly girl from Tennessee come down here and caught his eye. She, he caught her eye. And now they come to my house for some reason to, to, to get to know one another and to, to all this kind of stuff. And so he's over there until 10 o'clock at night, 11, 12 o'clock at night, whatever. And I'm an old man, Kurt. We're going to have to talk about his curfew thing. Uh, but uh, they come over there and guess what? I've got to know him a little bit. How is that? Because of a frequency of fellowship. Have you ever been to a family reunion? I, I don't like them. I'll just be dead honest with you. I do not like family reunions because there are about 17 people in my family that I know 
The rest of the 497, I have no idea who they are. And they remember some little short, fat, red-headed boy that used to run around with shorts and plaid shirts. And they'd say, are you Sadie's son? Yeah. I don't know who they are, but they... That's what I said. I remember when you used to do this. I don't remember that. I remember. I don't remember that. Understand that was 35 years ago. I don't remember that. But now somebody came, hey, I saw you yesterday. And last, last week when we talked, you remember what we talked about? You remember where we you remember when we went fishing last month? You see, there's 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 a, a fellowship that was fostered, if you will, that I can communicate with those people. But those folks that have not seen in forever, it's hard for me to strike up a conversation about things that happened 35 years ago. If you've ever been into a church and maybe somebody has left the church and they've come back, you can mark it down. Even with open arms, it's going to be awkward the first couple of services. And there's some folks that have left our body of believers that I want them to come back. And I will welcome them with open arms. But I can assure you it's still going to be awkward because of that broken fellowship. But I'm glad the same grace, mercy, and love that we talked about just a little while ago is still in effect. And I'm glad that even though someone may not have been here for a couple months or a week or one service, when they come back, I'm glad that we can open our arms and welcome them back with love, with care, with grace, with mercy. And it may be awkward for a little while, but very soon that fellowship can be restored. There is a, the anticipation we need to meet to encourage one another. He says, let us, he says, not forsaking and assembling them ourselves together as a man of some, but exhorting one another. And so much the more. In other words, we need to do it now more than we ever had before. As ye what? See the day approaching. I believe we can, as a fellowship of believers, we can find comfort in the coming of the Lord. And this thought hit me when we were going to Tennessee the other day. I got to thinking about all of the trouble that is in our country and all, you know, you know all the problems that we're having right now. And it's been said time and time again, I, I wonder when the Lord's going to come back. Or I hope the Lord's going to come back. Or you mark it down, the Lord's about to come back. And the thought hit me, Jamie, when is the last time you prayed that the Lord would come back? When is the last time that you prayed like John and said, even so, come Lord Jesus? And I ask you the same question. When is the last time that you asked the Lord to return? I, I believe that in our churches today, we... we a good majority of people believe that he could come today. But even in that majority of people that believe he could come today, I would say the majority of those do not live like he could come today. But if we could but begin to ask the Lord to come, and we can get that in our prayer closet. And we can get that in our prayer life. God, I want you to send your son. I'm ready to go home. If we could truly begin to pray that, then I believe that, that naturally, organically, we would begin to live like he could come today. And I think that's what we need in this church and every other church in this entire world. We need the Christian. We need this, these believers. Our family in Christ, we need to be looking for his return. We need to be acting like he could come any moment. But I believe we need to be asking for him to come any moment.
Let's stand.